Okay, welcome everyone to another episode of Factory Talk. Uh, today we have with us Mark Witten of Spartanburg. Factory Talk, Secrets of Effective Plant Leaders, produced by... Mark, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself and your, and your company? Thanks, Jamie. Glad to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, Mark Witten, I'm uh, President and CEO of Spartanburg Steel Products in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Uh, a little bit about myself, I'm, I'm Canadian. Um, started my career actually with Freightliner Heavy Trucks on the shop floor. I was an employee in the shop floor, so I have a different perspective um, in terms of the, a view, let's say, of management and different things like that, and we'll probably get into that. I uh, had the opportunity, worked with General Motors for a little bit of time, um, and then moved to uh, Tier 1 with Magna International and uh, spent seven years with Magna in Canada, went to Mexico for six years as an AGM, came back to Canada as a general manager. And then in 2015, I came to the United States. I ran a seeding plant in Cleveland, uh, and then I was recruited to Margarita, which is another uh, large Canadian automotive tier one. I ran a plant in Shelbyville for a few years, then I took a director of ops role, and then I was recruited to Spartanburg. And I've been here a year on March 5th. Uh, Spartanburg is a, is, a, is a great company, family-owned business, uh, more than 40 years, same families own the business. Uh, we are a steel supplier, uh, welded assemblies, et cetera, BMW, uh, multiple customers, including Magna and Tier 1s, also uh, non-automotive. So we do uh, Kubota, John Deere, uh, Volvo Heavy Truck, Mac, CBG. So we've got a, a lot of, uh, and Honda, but a lot of different uh, customers. Very good. So you, you've had quite a quite a history of very, very large, mature, integrated companies, uh, smaller companies, uh, move around quite a bit. You've, you've seen an awful lot of different management systems and, and uh, been at different ends of those management systems. So, you know, uh, particularly important to pay attention to as you enter a new organization, as you have many times. So, so as, a, as an operational-minded uh, leader, uh, what are your most important touch points in the organization that really give you a sense of, of how things are going and, and where attention is needed? Yeah, great question. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of different things. Um, we utilize surveys with employees. Uh, we do coffee chats. We've got Ask the President box so people can put anonymous questions in, uh, focus groups, town halls. But most important is walking the floor, talking with the people, you know, observing, listening, asking questions to me is the most important thing that I can do and the leadership team can do to truly, truly get the pulse of the organization. I mean, there's a lot of other data points, of course, you know, our, our quality performance, our relationships with customers, the community relationship, our, our operational OEE. And I mean, there's a lot of things that we look at, but if I really want to feel how the organization is, is really working, there's a, there's a couple of things. And, and mainly for me is, is being on the floor and talking to the people and also you know, in my, in my past life, a couple of things I, I look at very quickly in an organization, the current management's behavior. So I observe how management behaves. I go to employee bathrooms and I check out how the bathrooms are. I go to the back of the plant because that's, the, that's where all the sins are hid, hidden. And in our, our case, as a stamper, I go to the press pits and I see how things, you know, because that'll truly tell me how the organization is, is caring for their people, you know, the dignity and respect piece. Um, and how management behaves. And, uh, you know, I've, I've had experiences, um, you know, I, I won't say where, but, you know, went to a new organization, underperforming, met with the management team day one, went and walked the floor. I asked them to walk and I follow. As I follow, what I'm doing is observing their behavior. And what I got to see on the first day was, you know, not following safety rules, walking past garbage on the floor, you know, et cetera. So I knew right away what, what the problem was in that organization, and it was management's behavior, and it was their lack of leadership, their lack of leading by example, and uh, et cetera. So, yeah. That's, that's great. That um, certainly says a lot about, you, you know, what's important to you as a leader uh, in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the organization and the management behavior. Um, you know, as you do those floor walks, do you have standard work, or is that more driven by intuition and relationships yeah it's, it's probably more the latter um you know we are we are in the process of developing standard work for leaders and, and that kind of thing we do have some standard work we've got you know touch points and meetings on the shop floor and cadence we, we talk a lot about cadence and accountability here 
so we do have those touch points we you know we look at stuff hour by hour shift by shift day by day weekly monthly quarterly so we've got a lot of stuff let's say structured but what, from an intuition perspective and listening and talking with the people this is where i truly get the, the pulse and the understanding and, and that is where, where the organization needs to go it's a little bit more touchy-feely that way yeah yeah certainly it, it tells you i mean those are those are hard things to fake uh the press pits and the uh the back of factory and, and those are they're hard things to fake, you know, and, and, and put on a show either. It is what it is. Right. So right. Uh, they are great, great uh, places to get a sense of things. Um, uh, and, and so you, you talked about management behavior, you talked about culture a bit. Um, you know, wh what do you see as your role? What do you personally do to help shape the culture once you, once you know what you need to fix or improve or, or leverage? Right. Well, I, yeah, that's a great question. And, and I would say it, the short answer is I am, I am the culture agent here in this company and my behavior and, and what the, the pace and the tone that I set is ultimately the culture of the organization. So I truly take that as very seriously in terms of my behavior, how I lead, because it ultimately will transition to the culture of the company. Right now, uh, Spartanburg, we're in a transition and we've, we've really, we've coined it Spartanburg Steel Products 2.0 or SSB 2.0. And this whole 2.0 really is about the future. And what I wanted to do is honor the past because, you know, 40 years of ownership, this company has been a BMW supplier for many years. It's a good company, family owned, great people. I have people here that have been here 40 years, you know, average service is 10 to 15. You know, mm -hmm. So we got a lot of long-term service people. And I wanted to honor the past. 1.0 is the past. And they did a lot of, a lot of, did a lot of great things, but 2.0 is the future. And as you know, very well know, the future is changing on us, uh, and especially in these times. So we have to think a little bit differently. We need to be more in terms of lean manufacturing and, and these types of things, all that. But, but ultimately, in, in my opinion, culture of a company is, is the secret weapon. You know, if you have an engaged workforce, if people are behind you, if they understand the vision, if they understand what the measurements are, what they need to do each and every day when they come here, it's an extremely powerful uh, um, set of set of. Uh, you know, abilities, let's say. And and this is where I change. So back to your question, I am the change agent. I am the culture agent here. I, I see my role as that, setting the tone, making sure I communicate clearly, making sure that I am the person that shows the most dignity and respect in the organization, et cetera. And that transitions to leadership. The leadership team clearly understands my expectations of them around that. And we, you know, we, we really spend time with the frontline leaders to make sure because the frontline leaders, and I know, you know, that's probably something we should talk about, Frontline leadership is is critical because every time a supervisor has an engagement, speaks with an interaction with an employee, they're speaking on my behalf, you know, and 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 that and I need to make sure they understand very clearly that your words and how you treat employees is how they view me as their leader, and so it's extremely important that they understand dignity and respect is first and foremost in this organization. We need to listen to our people, we need to act upon it, we need to hold our people accountable. I mean, I'm very tough on my people, but I do it in a very high level of dignity and respect. So that's that's how I see my role here as a the culture agent. That's great. Uh, I want to come back to frontline leaders in a bit, but um, it is staying on culture. And I and I, I really like the idea of the 2.0. Um, I think that's really smart. It's 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 acknowledging all the great things that got them to where they are today, but but saying but then acknowledging that we have to go somewhere different in the future to be successful right. and I, I think that's a an important especially with a tenured uh, tenured team like that um and and role modeling is one of the most important things to drive culture um i sometimes like to quote myself one of my favorite is you know uh, 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 if you aren't role modeling if no one sees you do it so that that visibility what you talked about earlier of being on the floor or being close to the people is, you know, provides you that opportunity for people to see you lead. So, so that, yeah. that, that ties in very well with what you're, what you're saying about your role. Right. And, and if I can expand, you know, things leading by example is one of the most important things in my opinion, for any leader, you know, you can't, you, you, I can't walk on the shop floor and ask people to do things if I'm not willing to be the first guy through that gate. So we have done things, for example, the parking lot behind me, the management team, including myself, painted the curbs. They need to be painted red and yellow, et cetera. So we went out and painted them this past year. Um, 
cleaning. We go out for two hours a week, every single week as a management team, and we clean on the floor, declutter, clean, organize. And, you know, and the reason, the exact reasons for doing those things is to, is to show the people how important that is, first and foremost, and that this management team is willing to do whatever. I might have a title of president CEO, but I don't care if I'm cleaning the bathrooms or cleaning the back of the plant or emptying garbage. It doesn't matter to me. It's contribution to the organization. And I want the people to see how the importance of it is. Picking up garbage is one of my biggest pet peeves. You know, I don't think, again, I cannot walk this floor and expect, and I have high expectations around housekeeping, et cetera, but I cannot expect the organization and the people to pick up garbage if I'm not willing to do it myself. Mm -hmm. So I'm the guy that's always walking, picking up garbage, et cetera. And I want the people to see that because then I can hold them accountable. And then I can say, you need to pick up the garbage because for sure they understand that I'm doing it. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's key. Even as an outside person coming in and coaching other, other leaders, I, I'll do a floor walk with somebody and I'll, I'll pay attention to, are, are they picking up garbage along the way? Um, it, it's one of the things I'm, I'm looking for um, just from, from a leader behavior. So that's, that's great. Um, so what, what are some, you talked about safety and, and sort of caring for, caring for the facility and, and uh, with things like picking up garbage. What are some of the most important behaviors that you think the culture needs to demonstrate? You know, dignity and respect. You know, I, I think every interaction with whomever it is in, in this organization needs to be held with the highest level of dignity and respect. Again, we can ask a lot from our people, and I do. Um, we can have very high expectations and hold people accountable, but there is a right way and a wrong way. And, I, and I've, I've said this in, in the past, you know, I, the easy button is the power, is the I have the title, I have the position, do what I say because I'm the boss. The, the far more difficult is to influence people, you know, to influence them to do the right things. And you have, you have that's a more, it's more work, it's more effort, et cetera, but it is the right thing to do, in my opinion. So dignity and respect is the cornerstone of, of culture in this company. Um, there are many things, again, that we, we look at and we measure and different things, but, but from a culture perspective, really, it's that. It's accountability. It's dignity and respect, and those 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 three, in my opinion, are the keys. That's great. You can go go quite far with uh, with that. So, um, and and a key to that is your is your frontline leaders. You mentioned them earlier as being uh, sort of uh, the, the representative of you in the organization. Um, so, what do you what do you look for for effective frontline leaders? Uh, whether you're promoting or hiring or or uh, sustaining and building what you already have. What are you, what are you looking for? Yeah. You know, it's what I already said. So I, I we, we certainly want uh, supervisors, frontline leaders who, who can hold people accountable. Um, but, but I want ethical leaders. I want them to have credibility and I want them to be, to have dignity and respect. I mean, those are, those are really important. They obviously, and I, having said all this, we want the highest skilled people. We want performers. We want, you know, we want drivers. We want people that are going to push the organization. But it, but it has to be with credibility and dignity and respect, et cetera, right? And again, I go back to that same reason. Back in 2018, I presented at the Manufacturing Technology Conference on frontline leadership, very specifically, because I am so passionate. And it comes from my time on the shop floor. As a, as a young person working in a freight liner, I was a shop floor employee. I was swing, uh, you know, slugging steering gears and frame rails, and I had supervisors. And I'll never forget the good ones and the bad ones. <laughs> they both taught me some really important lessons, but it formed who I am today. And I believe that the frontline leader is ultimately when, it, when an employee answers a survey or tells anyone how they feel about an organization, what they're telling you is how they feel about that leader, bottom line. Because that interaction day by day, if they're treated with respect and they're listened to and we follow up on their questions and we give them, we don't have to say yes. And that's the thing I remind this leadership team of over and over. It doesn't have to be yes, but if an employee asks you a question, you need to follow up. I mean, that's part of the burden of leadership is as a leader, you need to do that, but you don't have to say yes. You say no and you explain why, and that's okay. But I feel very strongly about frontline leaders. And again, I go back to that, what I said earlier, they are my voice. They are, they are exactly... But that, what that employee thinks of the organization and me is what the words that come out of that supervisor's uh, mouth and how they how they treat that employee. So very passionate about frontline leadership. That's that's great. That's 
Um, so, so building or building past that a little bit, looking at the rest of your ecosystem uh, of what you build, uh, let's talk about metrics a bit. Um, you, you mentioned those earlier and, and some of the key metrics. You know, how do you how do you utilize metrics in in, in your operation? Uh, how do you how do you design them or select them? Uh, how do you utilize them to help drive your performance and 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 your your culture? Mm. Great question. So we're in a we are in a transition. We're always transitioning here, it seems. So part of 2.0 is is transitioning to and I'll, and I'll say Funnel Cloud, for example. We're we're gonna we're gonna tie in with Funnel Cloud, and that's gonna be our metric system, our software. Right now, it's more hand bombing. I mean, we got a lot of hand bombing of of information and data and things like that. So and that that's you know there's there's room for error there. So we want to take PLC data real time drive our maintenance schedules based on that PMs and predictive, you know, monitoring equipment, uh, you know, vibration analysis, all that kind of stuff. So we're very focused on, on the pulse of the organization in terms of data and we're transitioning right now to that. So we're in, that's in the process. Key metrics, we talk about SQDCM, safety, quality, delivery, cost, motivation. We, within that, buried within that are multiple, um, uh, uh, let's say data points that we, we look at. Our cadences, we have morning meetings on the floor where we walk through any safety items. We use the, the, the fast response system for safety, for quality, workforce planning. We look at metrics in terms of OEE and strokes, you know, like downtime changeovers. We do a lot of that kind of stuff and countermeasures. We do, we keep it separate in two ways. What information we share with employees, I try to keep it very straightforward. For example, a head behind. So we have, you know, if it's an assembly cell, you have a target of X jobs per hour. We have uh, basically screens that are going in there that show target, actual, net, positive, negative. We keep it that way. We don't measure OE on the floor from an operator perspective because often find management teams don't understand OEE. So we try to keep it very straightforward from a higher level. Um, from the management side, we look at OEE, of course, we look at changes. So a lot of, we have a lot of data, but the cadence really is minute by minute, hour by hour, shift by shift. This is how we collect and how we, how we look at the data points. Management review is weekly. Myself and the team where we really get into all, of, all the data. You know, it's a two and a half hour meeting. We go through finance, data, we, we, everything. And, and we really adjust weekly because you can't wait till the end of the month and look backwards and try to make an adjustment. You got to be looking forward. So week one, we, we look day, daily, but weekly, are we on target, off target? What do we do? How do we adjust positive, negative? So we're doing that. And then that management review looks at, you know, weekly, monthly, and then we have quarterly offsites where we do some strategy sessions and we make adjustments. So quarterly, are we on plan, off plan? Do we need to make some negative, positive adjustments, et cetera? So do a lot of, a lot of cadence around metrics and data in this organization. That's, that's great. It's really the, the two sides of, of you, proper utilization of data. It's having effective data. So it sounds like you're, you're cleaning up and, and, and organizing that end. And then how do you utilize it, which, you know, cadence, you know, who's doing what, when, right? The cadence becomes really important and, and, and you know, really sounds like you have a thoughtful process of building up from, you know, minute by minute, hour by hour, shift by shift, all the way to quarter by quarter. So uh, it sounds like it all starts to, starts to fit together as a comprehensive management system. Um, right. So yeah. within that, and I just, you know, SQDCM, it's, it's almost, uh, we used to talk years and years ago about just QDC, where, where safety was a separate thing and motivation and morale was, was uh, its, its own thing. But SQDCM is really, in a lot of the world, taken on a, a life of its own as a, as a key standard. Within all that, how, how do you set, how do you set performance goals? Uh, do you, do you, are they dynamic? Are they short-term, long-term based on past performance, based on customer needs? How do you, how do you think about driving the organization with goals? We use the four disciplines of execution. So Covey's system of the, and we use wildly important goals. So at a, at a high level, um, and I'll go walk backwards. Um, the end of last year, we were setting the wigs, what we are wildly important goals for 2021. Um, we set, we did set three as a management team, and then we have subwigs. So we've got the three wildly important for the plant, and then every subwig is built on supporting those three wigs. That's that's the upper level stra strategic way of doing it. And I mean, that's a, that's a that's the the Reader's Digest very quick version. Obviously, it took us 
a lot of time to develop the goals and then to make sure we were linking and looking at leading and lagging indicators and looking at the right things. And we measure those. Um, those are part of management review. We have them visually in the plant. So we're, we're doing that. Really, that, that, really that, is our, that is our ultimate goal setting uh, tool. We use that four disciplines mindset. We use wild important goals. Uh, we're using A3s to develop plans and we're using other tools, but from, a, from an overall goal setting, everything is built off the wakes. And, and what I've explained, that, and, the, and I, I learned this in my past life and, and I was fortunate to do that. And I was able to carry this forward here at Spartanburg. You know, it, it's really important that we have linkage to the wildly important. What I've found in many organizations, I'm sure Jamie, you've seen the same thing. If the goals are all disconnected, you've got, everybody's got 30 goals they're working on. I'm pretty darn sure 99% chance you're not gonna achieve too much. If you're very laser focused and you keep that, you know, inch wide, mile deep, so to speak, you know, you've got three goals and each leader has only three goals that support those wigs, you can knock it out of the park. And I can, I can, I can tell you, you know, we are, our, our fiscal year is, is ending in October. So we're five months into 21 and, and we are, have exceeded all of those three wigs at this point. We are, are exceeding at this time. And I, and I truly believe it's because that's where the team is focused. They are 100% focused on those goals. Uh, we're not distracted about, and you know, it's the whirlwind theory. There's a lot of stuff going on every day around you. You got to manage that. But yeah, I would prefer it to be an 80-20, but 80% of your effort into the wildly important and manage with the 20% on the, on, on the whirlwind. So that's, that's how we uh, manage goal setting here. Yeah, no, that's great. And, you know, focus, uh, you know, does an awful lot to get you across the finish line of, of, of performance versus, you know, getting started on a whole lot of things. Um, right. uh, it provides that focus, that prioritization, uh, uh, that, that digging deep um, that can re really help drive some progress. I do. So, I do remember, Jamie, sorry. You know, I, I, I learned the hard way because I go back many years and I had a lot of goals and, and I wasn't accomplishing much and I was struggling to understand why. And it's really because I was putting 2% into everything. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you're not getting too far when you're trying to push a rope uphill and you've got all these goals and you can't really. So I learned that. And then when I was taught the four disciplines from a, from a great journal manager in Mexico, uh, you know, and I started to compress very narrowly, all of a sudden, you know, the progress was, was exponential. So, yeah, it, it's, it, was, uh, it was through scars that I, I came to realize <laughs> it's a better way. Now, as a guy who likes to dabble myself, uh, it's, it, it can be a big a big threat to actual progress uh, when you when you spread yourself too thin. So, right. um, so so you mentioned sort of 80, 20, 80 percent focus on the on the wigs, um, on those wildly important goals. But as as I'm sure your organization deals with, uh, like everyone else, uh, particularly since the pandemic started, as if operations didn't have an, enough fires to fight, it's gotten you know far worse, whether it's uh, employee safety or employees in quarantine or supply chain disruptions. So the firefighting has gotten <clears throat> more difficult certainly over the last year. Uh, so how do you, how do you balance a uh, trigger, manage that balance between, you know, when are you just firefighting and when are you systemically making improvements, uh, solving real gaps? How do you balance that for, for the individuals, the, the teams, the organization as a whole? I see, um, I see that that being one of my more, most important roles is to keep calm in the organization and keep focus. So we, we've set up these cadence of accountability meetings, I would refer to them as, and that comes out of the four disciplines uh, language. We, we've got these touch points every day where we go and we walk through that, you know, safety, quality, et cetera. So really, you know, I see my role in, in those and, and some of the more senior leaders in this organization, our role there is to keep the team focused. So we can see very quickly, we know very, very quickly when there's hot spots and fires and things going on, we are always putting the parentheses around our people to stay focused here. And we're also diverting resources. So we know if we're in trouble in the press shop where we've fallen behind schedules, you know, and we're, we're, you know, we're heading towards an overtime on the weekend because of it, you know, we'll divert energy to helping that, that leadership team there get back on track. So we do that via you know, the daily touch points on the floor. We do that via management review, understanding where hotspots are, but, but it's really, it's really hands-on monitoring 
um, and myself with the other senior leaders being on the floor in these meetings, participating and seeing it and helping those teams react. What I found is if we're not doing that, and if I'm not doing that, then the teams start to get a little bit disjointed. And then, the, then to your point, the firefighting starts to take over the mindset and they walk away, they forget entirely about the wakes. By the way, we're not perfect. And I, and I mean, I'm, I'm you know, I, we've got a, a tremendous amount of opportunity to, to work on and, and I for sure would be the first one to admit that. But, uh, you know, as a leadership team and as we stay focused on, on improving and supporting each other, we're going to make a difference. So, but that's really it. It's hands-on monitoring and checking, you know, bringing everybody, centering them back to the wigs. We do that in management review. We do that in quarterly reviews, keeping them focused on it, making it visual. That's another big piece of it. If the goals are visual in your plant and all of your people understand and your leadership understands, it's far easier to keep people focused to that than if they're fighting fires every day. And fires happen, by the way. Of course they do. I mean, we, that's manufacturing. No, that's absolutely. Um, but I, I liked how you start, started with calm. I, I think, uh, you know, being able to, calm is one of those really important cultural indicators that you can't measure. It's actually hard to observe, but you can feel it. And, yeah. and boy, right. if you get, you get your operation to, to be calm, it's, uh, it's, it's to me a great indicator of a, of a good, good operational culture. Um, yeah. And it's, and if I can just add to that, you're, I, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. You know, you want, you want the, the organization to be what I like to see, you know, when you walk into an organization, um, you want to see people moving, you want to see some action, you want to see cadence, you know, you want to, things are, you know, happening. Uh, that's important. But at the same time, you sense to your point, you sense that there's calm and order and organization and things are moving in the right direction. People are hustling. That's good. Um, but at the same time, there's a sense of, of calm. And, and I fully agree with you. And by the way, and you know, um, better than me, I'm sure you walk into an organization that's in chaos. And you can feel that pretty much at the front door. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. You can feel it quite suddenly when, uh, you know, the person you need to meet with is, is, is too busy to meet with you for, for starters. So, right. Um, not a good indicator. Not a good indicator. So, hey, one last question for you. You just you've had a very interesting career. Uh, you've moved all over the place and 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 continued, uh, you know, an upward trajectory. Uh, a lot of the people that watch this this Factory Talk video series are are uh, aspiring leaders, people that want to that have a career in in operations and manufacturing. Um, what advice do you have for people that are they're looking to to take on a, a leadership role in, in manufacturing? That's a great question. I appreciate that. You know, I, I wrote about uh, and it's on my LinkedIn, the burden of leadership, I call it. And, uh, and this was this was this was learning uh, as a young man with my father in particular. You know, my, my father was an executive, but he was but he was and I, and I speak about this in the article. You know, he, he suffered a little bit from depression and he was hot and cold. And I always remember as a young person thinking to myself, I don't know if it's a good day to talk to him today. Maybe I got to wait till tomorrow. And I always had to select my time with him. And, and I, I, I resented that for a period of time until I understood it. And so when I wrote about this burden of leadership and this, I'm, I'm going to come to the point about leader, leaders, you know, being a leader is a burden. You know, everything we've talked about here, you know, the effort that you have to put in, the perfection that you have to be. Is I've, I've explained to this leadership team here that when you cross the threshold and the threshold to me is when you enter the front door, you need to be consistent every single day. You got to be the same person. I, you know, with do, all due respect, I don't care if you're having a bad day and I don't care if you had a you know, fight with your spouse, you don't bring that to work. The employees expect you to be consistent every single day. And I try to lead that in my personal life and at work. And I, I'm pretty sure you can ask any person in this organization if I'm consistent and they'll tell you, absolutely, yes. I am never yelling. I'm never, you know, in a bad mood. I'm always consistent. But the fact of the matter is, I'm just a person and I've got my own problems as well. So, but you have to overcome that. So what I'm, what I'm driving at here is if you want to be a leader, you know, that's great. And I love being a leader, but you've got to be a leader all the time, 24 seven. It's not a, it's not when you come in here and when you leave, you, you're a different person. You either are leading or you're not leading. And so to me, it's a little bit DNA, you know, do you want to, and do you have the skill set? And, and, and I always recommend leaders, you know, have a foundation and your foundation should be built off of things like dignity and respect. And you should like people. If you don't like people, leadership's probably not for you, you know, so that, that's, that would be my advice. I think it's really important you know, I, I love to, to work with young leaders in that. But again, there's a skill set 
you got to be good at your at your job, of course, but you got to have the, the basis or the foundation of leadership. And that, in, in my opinion, is always built around thinking your respect. That's a, that's a powerful story and uh, absolutely get on right advice. Um, uh, that's, that's, that's the burden and uh, not easy, but no. it's what's required and uh, extremely valuable. So thanks for sharing that. It's a great way to end. Thank you for joining us um, and talking with us. I uh, wish you and the Spartanburg team all the very best. I appreciate that, Jamie. Thank you so much.